Hello everyone and welcome to the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula's first part of our three-part virtual lecture series called Montana Votes. We're really excited to have you coming live with us today and hope that you also tune in and ask us some questions throughout the presentation. This is the first part. It is Montana's history of politics and women's suffrage and we're very excited to bring it to you. Definitely tune in and check your calendars for September 29th, where we will be doing Montana Votes 101, How-Tos, Myth-Busting, and History. So, um, like I said, we're excited to have you here today, and we are working with historic Wi-Fi and some fun technology, so bear with us if we have any frozen moments. And right now, I would love to present our guest speakers Diane Sands, Senator Diane Sands, who will be talking about the history of Montana's suffrage movement and politics, and Museum Assistant Ann Schmerl, who will also continue the discussion as she put a lot of this exhibit together. Thank you again for tuning in, and if you would like to support future programming like this, please check out our Donate and Support page on the museum's website, fortmissoulamuseum.org. Thank you very much. Thanks, that was great. You know, first of all, I want to thank the museum uh, for putting this exhibit on. It's just so important that in this day where we're having so many questions about voting and elections and what it means that we understand the history of this topic. Uh, history can teach us a lot of things and it gives us cause to celebrate certain things and to come to grips with our shortcomings and the errors that we've made in our ways over time. And certainly the suffrage movement is one of those examples of both great achievement and uh, some very serious shortcomings as well. And also I would say that this is a history that is not just crystallized in time back in 1920. It is an ongoing topic. I mean certainly all of you that are aware of uh, the modern world can't ignore the fact that the issue of the upcoming election and who gets to vote and issues of voter suppression and uh, all those related topics are critical at this time in our country as they were then and I would argue always have been because the United States is fundamentally a democracy and and it's based on the fact that people get to have their voices heard in their government that they get to elect their own representatives and to do that means they have to vote that means you have to vote and so when we look at how that's played out in the past which is one that's interesting at this point because it's been a few years since the passage and ratification and enrollment of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution in the federal Constitution. But this is a campaign that went on for a very, very long time. Uh, for those of us in the modern era who like things to happen like that and have very little patience for uh, the long process of politics and political and social change, this is a good example of what it takes to actually change something as significant as voting. As uh, Cherry, Carrie Chapman Catt said, and she was the last president of the North American Woman Suffrage Association, when she was talking about what it took to achieve this great victory, which was a victory, it's the biggest enlargement of the vote to a group of people without violence. Nobody died in this, which is certainly not true of most of our other significant social change movements. So this is what uh, Carrie Chapman Catt said. This is what it took. 56 campaigns of referenda to mail in voters. 480 campaigns to get legislatures to submit suffrage amendments to their voters. 47 campaigns to get state constitutional conventions to write women's suffrage into state constitutions. 277 campaigns to get state party conventions to include women's suffrage planks. 30 campaigns to get presidential party conventions to adopt suffrage planks. 19 campaigns with 19 successive Congresses. It was a continuous, seemingly endless, I'm sure it felt like that, chain of activity. Young suffragists who helped forge the last links of the chain in 1920 were not born when it began. And old suffragists who forged the first links in 1848 were dead when it ended. So in fact, it really is a testament to the commitment that it takes to make really significant change and to also seize the time when that time is uh, ready to make the leap in the end. So the work that the suffrage movement did over most of those uh, 72 years 
was a time where they were very limited in their successes. Um, certainly there are moments that are interesting as they try out different strategies. For example, in the beginning, the suffrage, early suffragists who come out of the abolition movement, including Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, etc., they come out of the abolition movement. And for them, the issue of voting, whether it's for African Americans or for women, is one of a natural right. Natural with an end, meaning God-given right, embedded in the Constitution. It can't be given to you, it is yours to claim. And so, for example, uh, Susan B. Anthony, under that theory, in, in 1872, uh, believed that she should just claim that right, that no one could give it to her. So she went with a group of about 50 women uh, to her polling place in New York and cast a ballot. She was arrested, she was tried, it's a very famous short trial, you can look it up and read it, it's very interesting. All male jury, male judge who had pre been predetermined what the sentence was going to be. She's convicted, she says nothing through all of this and then is asked to speak and she lets them have it about it. it's not a jury of her peers or anything else. She will not respect this com uh, conviction and she will not pay the thousand dollar penalty. She will use it to pay off her debt for her newspaper, The Revolution, instead. Um, Montana also picked up on that, so it wasn't just Susan B. Anthony, there was a group of women in Bozeman in 1872 as well, who went in and I think so startled the election judges, they just gave them a ballot and let them vote, versus having a whole other election and invalidating that one. But So that's one strategy that was tried. The state-by-state -state, uh, strategy was very important in the beginning of this suffrage movement, so they tried state-by-state -state to convince states to uh, secure the ballot for women, Utah being the first because Mormons also felt that this would legitimize in many ways their uh, right to access to being part of the country, Wyoming as well. The western states are the leaders in this, people have historians, we have arguments about why that might be, but it's for various different reasons. But it really isn't, uh, and Montana is first has a discussion of suffrage uh, with a territorial governor's wife who comes from Ohio where she had been head of a suffrage act organization and tries to convince the territorial uh, government to take an interest in this. They weren't interested in the slightest. And it really isn't until um, around 1910 with the progressive movement that you start seeing real energy around suffrage in the West in general. So we are not the first state, but we're the 11th state that, in fact, secures the ballot for women in uh, Montana in 1914 uh, with the help of many organizations. The national organizations are involved in this. And I would make the point that at this point, the strategy has changed and the argument for women to vote has changed. So we've moved away from that natural right of women as citizens to be able to vote. And if you're not a citizen, you, of course, can't vote. But the right to vote and participate in your government, to the fact that women have a special role to play, that women are morally superior to men and imbued with different characteristics that would allow them to go in and clean up the corruption of government, which was certainly uh, a huge part of the whole progressive era. So these women make a different argument, and you'll see many of the cartoons and things talking about women doing hot political housekeeping and cleaning up, cleaning house as they put it. And that was the argument made by some of the groups, particularly the Women's Christian Temperance Union. My grandmother was very active in it in Bozeman. I was pledged as a temperance baby myself as a child. And their agenda really illustrates the fact that most of these suffrage groups did not think of it solely as an ends to itself. Uh, they saw it as a tool toward achieving an, various agendas. And so for the suffrage groups, it was usually the issue of social change on a broad scale. The Women's Christian Temperance Union had a very broad political agenda, which included temperance, prohibition certainly, because they saw the damage that alcohol was doing, as it is doing now in our communities. And so their view was to get rid of it. For example, at that point, women were not legal persons under the law entitled to the same political rights that men were. So married women became uncoverture under the cover of their husbands. And so married women uh, couldn't take out a homestead in her own name, a single woman could. Married women were not entitled to their own property, their own income, and could not even be the guardians of their own children. Montana has a separate law, in fact, there's a book in the county records that is a record of women who are separating their own property for the purposes of creating a small business, usually being a milliner or sewing or something of that sort. So women aren't equal under the law even without uh, the ballot. And so the 
uh, winning of the ballot is an important part of achieving a broader social agenda that they felt passionately about, and that's what drives them. And the Women's Christian Temperance Union, at the time of uh, these, the campaigns for suffrage, say 1910 through 1920, really is one of a massive organization. Montana has 202 unions, Women's Christian Temperance Unions. Willard School in Missoula is named after Mother Willard, Frances Willard. And they, uh, those are mostly organized through Protestant churches across the state. There is an anti-Catholic theme to much of this, I will tell you that. One of our pay attention to history issues here. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union are very active. General Federation of Women's Clubs, which is the hugest national organization for women in the country at the time. They also are suffrage activists. The Montana Federation of Negro Women's Clubs, Colored Women's Clubs. There are 15 of those across the state of Montana. Montana at the time had a more sizable African American population tied to the military, tied to the railroad, and other kinds of things. They are very politically active for their agenda items, which include uh, suffrage, certainly, but again, they view it as a tool toward things like anti-lynching campaigns and the claiming of other uh, legal rights and economic rights on their behalf. So we see a lot of groups involved in the suffrage movement, including men's groups, who are very powerful in expressing, particularly male political leaders, in expressing their support for suffrage. So movements happen together. Movements don't happen singularly. They usually are a broad coalition of issues and interest groups that move forward together in a wave. As you kind of uh, know, those of you who are in the 60s and 70s, the movements for civil rights, for the anti-war movement, uh, the women's movement, gay rights movement, all kind of happen together because as one group looks and says, huh, interesting, how does that apply to my life? They go, maybe I need to get active and do something to create change in that area which is really how suffrage started when Susan, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott in 1840 were at the World Anti-Slavery uh, Convention in London and were required to sit up, even though they were delegates to the United States, required to sit up in the balcony um, and not vote. And so that inspired their saying, hmm, we might want to look at this from through the lens of gender as well. So the suffrage movement uh, has uh, a number of different interest groups now, I must say, uh, as we were just talking about some of its shortcomings. One of them certainly reflected the time it was in, which is a time of social change and trying to do progressive change in some areas, but also it is a time of nativism and racism, and that is reflected in this movement. Certainly, uh, we see it for African Americans uh, across the state who are, and in the country, who are denied their place in the movement, even though they are organizing it's the old, oh, you're separate but equal, but you're not really equal. Uh, and as I said, the Montana Federation of Negro Women's Clubs are very active in the state. In addition to that, we also see um, Native Americans who are active in Montana. One of the women that you should know about, if you don't, is Helen Clark here. And Helen was uh, born to a fairly prominent man uh, who was... Uh, Scottish and mother was Blackfeet and she was highly educated. She became and was elected as county superintendent of schools in Lewis and Clark County in 1882. She did face a great deal of discrimination even though she couldn't vote. A number of, uh, she finally, she served three terms in that role. But suffrage is, so these different groups are involved in the suffrage movement sometimes even though they cannot exercise the vote themselves and will not be able to for some time. The most prominent Native American woman who was involved in this discussion and this activism at the time is a woman I met as a, when I was in the fourth grade in Brockton, who, uh, um, Dolly Akers, excuse me, who uh, from the Fort Peck tribe, who was very involved in the national founding of the organizations that advocated in Congress for the American Indian uh, Citizenship Act. American Indians, although we're on their land, were not citizens in their own country until uh, 18, 1924, so that's quite late. If you're not a citizen, you can't vote. That also applies to things like the Japanese and Chinese immigrants who are coming in, not the ones who were born here, but who come in as first generation. There are laws in the United States, particularly against the Chinese Exclusion Acts and the Japanese, that prohibit them from gaining citizenship. And that doesn't really change uh, for quite a long time as well into the 1940s because, um, again, 
racial issues, issues of racism, economic competition, are in play with the Asians as well as with African Americans and, uh, and Latinos as well, although they're not a significant population in Montana. So it's 1924 when Native Americans secure the vote because they now are citizens of the United States. Now opposing all of this movement are quite a few strong special interest groups. This was not an easy fight. When people heard about it, they didn't just say, oh, that's a good idea, let's do it. A lot of this campaigning took place in churches, but it also took in places like in front of bars, where these women would drive out to these locations and stand in front of a store or any gathering at the post office or in front of the bars and talk to people about the right to vote. And the opposing forces to this are important to understand. And the, mo the biggest one of them, really, in this state is the liquor industry. And so the opposition in uh, communities such as particularly Butte, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Great Falls as well, did not vote for suffrage. Uh, and the reason was they knew the agenda of these organizations was basically prohibition. And that if, if they did win the vote, they would in fact pass prohibition, which in fact they did. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the activists for suffrage in the state of Montana, Maggie Smith Hathaway, comes out of Ravalli County, and she is a Women's Christian Temperance Union organizer. She works, drives across the state, I think she covers 5,000 miles in one of those little Model T's going out there talking everywhere about women's suffrage. After women win the, the vote in Montana, 1914, 1916 election, those women who gained all these political school skills decide to run for office. So we have uh, May Trumper, Superintendent of Public Instruction, an office then held by women with one exception to this day. We have two women elected to the legislature, Maggie Smith Hathaway and Emma Angles, who was the publisher of the Interlec from up in Kalispell. The two of them, and Jeanette Rankin, who's the first woman elected to Congress and the first woman elected to a national office anywhere in the world. Uh, Maggie Smith Hathaway and Emma Angles in the legislature, although they are different parties, they carry all of this suffrage agenda into the legislature. They carry the temperance bill. I just laughed when, in Maggie Smith Hathaway's account. She's sitting next to a Missoula legislator who was an alcoholic and drunk at the time. And it was the vote on prohibition. And he was kind of half passed out there. And she nudged him and said, vote yes, if you just voted. <laughs> Perfect example of the problem. Drinking in the Capitol was quite uh, provided by the liquor industry to make sure they were well liquored up for various things. So uh, in other states, child labor was a huge issue as well, and so they knew that women would carry this agenda, as did uh, both Maggie Smith Hathaway and Jeanette Rankin nationally, when elected, carried legislation that would provide funding and programs for women and children who were left destitute because the men they were with deserted them or spent all the money or whatever. So those programs really come out of women's agenda. As uh, Mother Willard said, she considered the ballot to be the home protection um, movement. And it was very specific what they wanted to do with that vote. And the opposing forces knew that, and that's why they were opposed, because it was in their self-interest to be opposed to suffrage based on those issues. It's the reason the South never voted for suffrage, uh, and also opposed everything from the Equal Rights Amendment, etc., is because of their fear that African American women would get the vote and would exercise that vote. So that level of racism still continues today because as I said, it isn't just an issue, do you have the legal right to vote, it's can you exercise that ballot. And so we see historically the issues of, particularly around for African Americans, Jim Crow laws, do you have to be able to read at a certain level, do you have a poll tax. Uh, we still see those in this state in various kinds of ways. Um, some states still have issues of having to have a certain kind of identification before you can re register to vote that's very difficult for some people to get. Homeless people, where are they going to get that? We also see it in terms of uh, whether your vote counts, because you can vote, but does it count? And we know that issue has come up in various ways. So on access to voting, for example, I work some with the disability community, and you know, until fairly recently, it was very difficult. No one thought disabled people should probably be voting anyway, because they probably weren't very competent to do it, but the fact of the matter is that right to have a secret ballot and to be able to exercise it is important and the, and the disability community's advocacy around this has been fabulous. We now have machines that are set up so that every person who's disabled can vote 
in private, you know, it's machines that allow people who are deaf or have uh, some level of blindness or whatever can exercise that vote in a private way. That's important. We've extended the vote down to people who are 18. We used to think it was only people over 21. We have extended it to people who are, have served their time in prison. Montana is one of a handful of states that says we take away their rights, including their right to vote, when you're convicted of a felony and sent to prison. When you are released from the correction system and have paid your, your debt, you should be restored of all of your rights as a citizen, one of those being the right to vote. Some states still don't allow that, and that's a very important political issue right now out there in the world. Um, it also could be issues related to access to being able to cast that ballot, which we're seeing now relative to absentee uh, ballots and the issue of, in a time of a pandemic like this, how dangerous is it for you to vote? So if you can vote absentee or by mail, you might vote in a way that you might not be willing to risk your life by going into a polling place with a couple hundred other people to cast a ballot. The other place that we've seen that, certainly in Montana, is um, a lawsuit that was raised by Janine Pease, who's a Crow woman, and um, a number of years ago around the native vote. Once we have a census, which we're currently in, and if you have not registered for the census, please do, it's critical. But the census is the basis for our redistricting every te 10 years. And redistricting means that the redistricting commission redraws all of our legislative districts. My Senate district is comprised of 20,000 voters. That, so that's equalized across the state. And that may take you 10 counties in eastern Montana, and it may take you just a chunk of Missoula County here because of the way people are stuck together. But um, prior to this lawsuit, the way those lines were drawn, some of you are familiar with the term gerrymandering, that meant that they would draw the lines around, you know, to exclude black people from a certain area, or in Montana's case, they would draw them so that there really was no potential for Native Americans ever to congregate enough of their votes to be able to elect their own uh, citizens to county commission races in that case. They were concerned about that. That went to the Montana Supreme Court and was ruled to be on uh, that they had to draw those lines in a way that allowed what they call communities of interest to be able to aggregate enough votes to be able to have their vote have a equal weight with someone else's who had a different community of interest. And because of that, Montana now has 11 legislators who are Native American. It's, one of the high, it's the highest percentage, I think, in the country. And that's been pretty consistent over the last 10 years. And it's because of that lawsuit and uh, the right to um, aggregate your votes so that your votes count and count equally with everyone else in the citizenry. The other access to voting issue that has been a topic in the last decade or so was the issue of, we all know what Montana winters are like, and election day can be a terror. It can have a blizzard. You can have it be 40 below. Um, all kinds of things. You can have the flu in the middle of flu season. So the issue of getting out to vote before we really had the broad access to absentee or just generalized vote by mail was that it really took an effort. You didn't get off of work if you were low income. That meant that a lot of lower income people who were working in uh, some jobs really, it was too difficult for them to get to uh, a polling place to vote. So they were discouraged uh, from voting. So what's really happened for many people in the most rural parts of our state is that for some of them they would have to drive 10, 20, 30, 40 miles to get to a polling place in terrible winter conditions with maybe a car that wasn't reliable, etc., or it didn't fit with their work schedule, and so they didn't vote. So the lawsuit that went forward, the complaint, was around that issue. And so we now have what are known as satellite voting a uh, satellite voting process where your clerk and recorder in your county can in these cases where it is difficult for people to get there in rural areas to set up these satellite voting places mostly on reservations so that we take the polling place to them versus the other way and I think that's why also the vote by mail issue has become such a big topic is everyone then has sent a ballot and is therefore encouraged to vote and we don't make it a series of hurdles that you have to jump over in order to make it uh, to the polling place and have your vote cast and have that vote actually count equally with everyone else. So this is a complicated topic, it is a very complicated history, um, and it has uh, 
admirable pieces to it that we want to learn from, and there are parts of it we need to learn from because they're not as admirable, but they are lessons to be learned. The issues of racism are still with us when it comes to voting in Montana as well as in other states. The issues of uh, other kinds of access, uh, it makes a difference. And so it, it's worth our time to look at the history of suffrage and also to understand it in the context of our current electoral process. And I think there are a few questions that might have come in relative to some of, of these issues. Yes, Scott. Yeah, the mic's right here. All right. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. that, Diane. Fascinating history. Lots of different things that happened in the past that are still impacting today. And thank you, everyone, who's joined us. And we do have several questions that have come in uh, via email and through our Facebook Live. So let's get started. This one is from Jasmine, and she asks, why is voting called suffrage? Well, suffrage is the term we give to, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question about suffrage, and also why do we call it woman's suffrage? It's not women's suffrage, it is woman's suffrage. Woman because they said even if uh, all women didn't want to vote, if one woman wanted to vote, it was her right to vote. Um, and I should say relative to that, to what suffrage is for, because we have suffrage for very specific issues, like on a local level, you have to live in a local area to vote on. You have to be a landowner who owns an irrigation ditch to vote in an irrigation district election. You have to be in a specific school district to vote in a school district election. Suffrage doesn't mean you get to vote everywhere, and that's why women's suffrage is an issue of universal suffrage at the national and other levels. Um, so. It is always limited. And some believed you, uh, in many places, women could vote well before all of this. If they own property, they could vote in school elections because men, in general, believed that women's special nature as mothers meant that they should have a say in, say, school elections, but they really didn't have the interest or the capacity to vote in, say, a national election. So. Suffrage is a word that applies. It's archaic. We don't use it anymore, but that's why it is woman suffrage. All right. That's fascinating. And here's another very interesting question that came in through our email. It must have been difficult for many rural women to join the movement since they had responsibilities at home. Communication was limited to newspapers and word of mouth. How did they juggle all they had to do and participate in the movement? Good question. Well, actually, there were a lot of ways they get involved in it. I think we think of people as being so isolated back then, and it's relative to our instant communication of today, perhaps they were. But in other ways, they certainly weren't. It wasn't just newspapers. If you looked at all of the cartoons and media campaigns that went on then, the thousands of pamphlets and leaflets that were put out, there wasn't a parade that happened that didn't have an entry from the suffrage group, whether it was for the 4th of July or whatever. And as I said, these women also just went out and campaigned door to door. They literally took those messages uh, out into the community. The Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, did its part a lot of times in front of bars and got into those arguments, uh, uh, soapbox arguments. But as I was talking about the Women's Christian Temperance Union having 202 unions in Montana, they did that work through their churches. So that was a place that women were already located and doing work with the men in their community. So it wasn't quite the same as saying, well, they were isolated out there and didn't have any time to get involved. That's true certainly for some, but there was some degree of leisure time, and this was very important to people. Women joined organizations. They joined their church organizations. They joined their community betterment organizations. And they certainly joined General Federation of Women's Clubs, uh, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, very low, way bigger than any women's organization we've got today. Way bigger. 4,000, 5,000 members in the state of Montana wow. with a much smaller population. We just don't get it. All right. So um, here is another interesting question that came in. Copper barons controlled the legislature in Montana for many years. How was the suffrage move movement viewed by those that controlled the legislature? The copper barons were at war with the labor unions. Did they try and break the suffrage movement also? Well, the 
as I said, this is just about the whole progressive movement of the day, is basically uh, the copper barons, that whole industry, uh, held a stranglehold on politics in the state of Montana. Uh, did not have a stranglehold on the people of eastern Montana. And there's a progressive movement out there today, which always surprises some people, particularly if they're not from Montana. Uh, the farmers of eastern Montana formed uh, the farm labor uh, organizations. They were very active in organizing on their own behalf out there. The Copper Kings and the Anaconda Company was very active. That's why Montana has a copper dome on top of the capital. It was given by the copper industry to just remind us every day when we walk in that building who owns the politics of this place. They owned the newspapers in the state, so their opinions were expressed on a regular basis there. So, But there were alternative newspapers everywhere across the state that, oppress, that expressed a different point of view. So they didn't... They certainly were powerful, and they controlled what they can control. But the major opponents to suffrage are not them. It's the alcohol industry. Fascinating. Here is another question that came in. Sometimes history gets a coat of whitewash, and the truth around a movement can be watered down. Were there examples of protests, marches, etc., using force to get their movement spotlighted on a larger scale? And following that is... Are there any examples of women losing their families or being put away by their husbands or families because of their efforts in the movement? Hmm. can't say that I totally know an answer to that last one. Most uh, women that are written about, like if they're part of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in these churches, their husbands also belong to that church and tend to be fairly like-minded. In fact, that was one argument why women don't need a vote, because clearly men, women would vote the same way their husbands do, so why give her the vote? You don't need to. She'll, her, her opinion will already be represented by her husband. As we all know who live in different families, husbands and wives can have different secret ballots that the other is not aware of, and that's critically important. But you asked about... Uh, these women learned how to use the media. They were great organizers. So, as I said, parades, um, uh, the voting in 1872 in Bozeman was a press event as well as a legal uh, challenge to the right to vote. But nationally is really where you see that question coming from because the uh, ladies behaving themselves, lobbying on a regular basis, being respectful to President Wilson, doing that kind of campaigning didn't seem to be getting them anywhere. Britain had taken a different, they're the suffragettes, we're the suffragists. You call an American a suffragette, and you're really calling her a bra burner equivalent. It is not, it's a derogatory term in the United States. But um, um, Alice Paul, who had to spend some time in Europe, with, in England, with the suffragettes, who were quite militant, they went them through herself in front of the king's horses and was killed. They slashed major artworks in art galleries saying, this artwork is more important to you than me as a human being. They took a whip at the prime minister. They um, were very militant. They went to prison, many of them, and so they paid. It was a very much a militant uh, approach to it. In the United States, that wasn't the case until Alice Paul organizes the Congressional Union, becomes the Women's Party, and then founds the Equal Rights Movement. They're the ones who say, we're going to chain ourselves to the White House because President Wilson won't listen to us. That was just unheard of. You, were, you just didn't do that. So they would stand day after day, night after night after night, in front of the White House and uh, were attacked by the police, attacked by mobs of citizens, thrown in prison, force-fed some of them, and one of them is a Montanan. Uh, Hazel Hunkins from Billings, who is a young woman, again, very much aligned, with this kind of activism versus the older women who were more aligned with the traditional political model of organizing. So Hazel was very involved in D.C. in that kind of activism. She was taken to the prison. She was one of the ones who was force-fed there. So she, that's the issue of different strategies, sometimes work together really well because finally all of that together in addition to World War I arising where those women were humiliating the president by holding up things saying, you know, the Kaiser denies rights to people, and you're denying my rights, too. So comparing the United States government and President Wilson to the Kaiser going into a war uh, finally moved enough people so that Wilson agreed, and they agreed to put it out to the states uh, for ratification. Fascinating. 
Here is a question that just came in online, and this is a little bit more about the history of Montana politics, not quite so much the suffrage movement. What is the situation in Montana regarding the dismantling of the coastal system? Which I don't know if that correlates to our topic right now. But. Well, as a legislator, I don't know that it correlates to that. Although it's important, you know, access to the ballot. Again, if you can't cast a ballot and be assured that it's going to be counted, you know, that's a discouraging thing to say, well, it doesn't matter, why should I even vote? So that issue of making sure that the Postal Service is going to be there, is going to pick up your ballots. I used to do work with the Elections Office here. I know the work they and time they spend with the Post Office making special arrangements for late delivery on that day to make sure every ballot that is postmarked on that day gets into the elections office so that it can be counted. Now, I think they've stepped back from um, dismantling our postal system and removing boxes, etc. So I'm, n I'm not sure that it's going to, at this point, adversely affect Montana because the citizens have stepped forward and said, no, we're not going to tolerate that. Uh, and maybe this question uh, from Tony about our postal service will be better uh, talked about in more detail exactly. with next month's upcoming uh, Part 2 lecture series, Voting 101, How-Tos, Myth-Busting, and History, when we talk with Bradley Siemens from the Elections Office and Vicki Zaire, who's from, who worked in the elections for 35 or 40 she, she years. She was the prominent elections person in the whole state of Montana, particularly when we expanded voting access through same-day voter registration, you know, so people could wait, I don't know why, but would wait till the last day to decide they wanted to go register and vote. And we had those really long lines. Well, now you can still do that. You can register on the last day and vote on the last day. But if you get a ballot and are going to be sent in Missoula, every citizen who's, who's registered to vote will get a ballot. The way to avoid the issue with the post office is when you get it, Voted. Actually, we historically see when people get that ballot, about a third of them just go ahead and vote it within that first week. Otherwise, it gets lost in that pile of mail. you got to go find it. You might have to cast a provisional ballot. Uh, if you get a ballot, vote the ballot when you get it. Fantastic. So we'll move back into some more um, history and suffrage information. And uh, definitely remember to tune in September 29th. When we do go into more detail about that myth-busting and history of Missoula and Montana voting uh, policies and best practices. And you'll be fascinated by it because I have been through that 12 hours of training to do that. I know the effort they put into checking the signature on every ballot and just amazing amount of accountability to make sure that ballot came from that right person and that it's counted. Yeah, uh, just in the 30 minutes I talked with Bradley in getting the uh, lecture series set up for next month, I learned so much. So I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you all tune in too. So going back to some other fun questions that we have been received, and remember if you're Facebook Live and you have a question, send it in. We've got a, a few more minutes here. So um, when did Montana ratify the 19th Amendment? As Montana extended the right to vote to women six years before the National Amendment, what is the status of the ERA in Montana? And what is happening to the ERA on a national level? And you might also want to explain what the ERA is. There's several things in there. Okay, let's start with the ERA. So as I've said repeatedly, the access to the vote is not just because it's a nice thing. These groups that are working for access to the ballot they're doing it because they consider it to be a strategy, a political strategy, to create some kind of change. Just like all of us who vote, we're doing it because we're voting for something, because we want childcare or a railroad or whatever it is we might want. We're voting for issues and causes and, and values that we care about. So um, as the ballot was won at the national level, all these organizations were, of course, uh, energized to think about what next. So they won this enormous victory. Well then what did they do with their organizations and their skills and how do they mobilize women voters? Because some people say, well women, you know, they're just not too educated to figure out what the issues are. So particularly the National American uh, uh, Women's Suffrage Association became an organization you all know, which is the League of Women Voters. League of Women Voters. So they were going to 
help women voters understand issues. So uh, they were all across the country. They took on that infrastructure of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Have I got that right or is it the women's? Yeah, they did. it, And they became the organization that then uh, developed platform issues on every possible issue. And in Montana, we really owe the Montana Constitution to them because they are the group, particularly out of Missoula, that in the uh, early 70s are the ones who had decided that we needed to reorganize our very old, out-of-date Montana Constitution. They studied it as the League would just study issues for like two to three years before they take a position on anything. They had network between other educated women across the state, and they decided that Montana should have a new constitution. They convinced the governor and the legislature to call for a constitutional convention. Then a number of them ran to be delegates to the convention because no elected official could serve. And so of the 100 delegates, 19 of them were women, and I think about 15, 16 of them were League of Women Voters women, in addition to the American Association of University Women. They already had platforms that they wanted included in that constitution, and they moved them forward, just like the suffrage grandmothers did before them. So the League took that issue on, and they also took on, particularly Alice Paul, the Equal Rights Amendment. They said, okay, you've got the vote, but do you have any rights? What are the issues that flow for it? And clearly, women did not have equal rights then, nor do we have them yet today, I would remind people. But ex examples of that might be, in 1919, uh, Maggie Smith Hathaway, who as I said was one of the first two women in the legislature, carried, well she carried the suffrage amendment, she carried the prohibition uh, law statute, and she also carried one for equal pay for equal work for women in Montana. First one in the United States, 1919. Women currently make 79 cents in Montana, white women, for uh, compared to men. We're not there yet. How did she get to that point? Well, she had been a school teacher, a county superintendent of schools, and she saw that teachers, women teachers, were paid half of what men were paid. My mother is a teacher. The school offered her half of what they offered my dad as a teacher. So this is not just ancient history. These topics still go forward into our time. So the Equal Rights Amendment uh, was advocated for in 1921, as soon as women had the ballot, and the League of Women Voters got organized to try to educate and uh, move women into the political arena. And we did see some women move into electoral arenas, like I'm saying. You see in Montana, superintendent of schools, some legislators. But for the most part, women didn't overwhelmingly start running for office. But they did vote, and they did vote on these issues in a, quite a different way than, than men did. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, um, not a heck of a lot passed in that until the 1970s, when that became a major issue. Um, it failed, as some of you know, Montana did pass it, we're one of the first states, it's in fact in our constitution that women have equal rights. Because we have the most progressive constitution in the United States, because it was done in the 70s, a time of great liberalism, it reorganized our government, we have a fundamental right to transparency, so issues of uh, money in politics, you go back to the company, uh, they bought elections, I mean they weren't even shy about it. And you're talking about the Anaconda. Anaconda Company and the other big political interests just bought, bought elections. Um, but the Montana Constitution's provision around uh, transparency and accountability, etc., really put a stop to that and Montana's laws around that. In fact, that's why we have such strict campaign limits currently. Is uh, And they were challenged in court and they were challenged all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled in our favor because of this legacy with the company buying votes that we have always had a concern for that issue of, of uh, making sure that our elections are transparent and accountable to the people and not big corporations. So we owe all of that to coming out of that League of Women Voters thread and the right to vote and, and that constitution that's really embedded directly in the League of Women Voters work around uh, elections in particular. Awesome. We just... And as far as it goes, yeah, Montana passed the Equal Rights Amendment. As you know, it was fell one sh short at the federal level. Now there's another state that's passed it. It's still in debate as to whether uh, that ratification is open or if fact it was totally legally closed. I think it'll end up going to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the ratification of the 19th Amendment, all one has to tell this tale shortly no matter what, people want to say, oh, my vote doesn't matter. Well, i got to tell you in Montana, so many legislative races are won or lost by less than 100 votes. One of mine was by 32 votes in a recount. I mean, this is not uncommon in Montana that it's a very small number of votes. One of my fellow senators, three votes, three votes. 
out of 20,000 voters. Big deal. Well, in fact, the ratification of the 19th Amendment would not have happened but for one vote. It was the last state, Tennessee, that was eligible that they thought they had any chance of winning to have them ratify, the Constitu ratify this amendment. And they worked at it and had counted their votes and they didn't think they had them. And what happened was one of the young men, uh, uh, Representative Burns, 21 or 29, very young man, walked onto the floor and he had already committed to voting against ratification and his mother sent him a letter and he pulled it out and it said, be a good boy and vote with Mrs. Cat and give women the right to vote. And he came in and took off the red rose of the anti-suffragists and put it down and voted. For, I get goosebumps. I have goosebumps now. <laughs> I mean, it's such a powerful story of the power of one vote to literally change the world. Wow. And when you vote, you, cha you vote to change the world. I mean, it is the most powerful thing you have in your life. It's more than money. It's more than anything. If you're going to live in a democracy, it's your responsibility and your right to vote. Yeah, I got goosebumps as you were telling that story as well. That's amazing. We've had a couple more questions come in online. And this one is from Stacy. How was Jeanette Rankin involved in supporting the local suffrage groups? Jeanette Rankin was a paid organizer. She got her start, um, as some of you know, you can read many of her biographies that are around. Uh, on the East Coast, uh, she worked with Jane Addams and uh, suffrage in um, settlement houses. So she had a broad education in sort of uh, women's social issues of different kinds. She had been hired and had been working. She'd actually lived short for a short time in New Zealand where women had the vote. So she has a background in this topic. When she was working for the National American Women's Suffrage Association in the state of Washington, when the Montana campaign then got up and going, they sent her back to her home state to kind of head up the suffrage organizations in the state of Montana. That doesn't mean she heads up the Women's Christian Temperance June. It certainly does not mean that she did this by herself. As I said, this is the achievement of thousands of men and women who worked on this topic. Uh, and I think to the degree we make her out to be the sole champion of this topic, it disempowers people versus empowering people because you think, oh, I'm not Jeanette Rankin. Who could be Jeanette Rankin? Well, the fact of the matter is we're all Jeanette Rankin. You get out there and do your job and work as hard as you can for the causes you believe, and that's what you do, and that's what she did. And uh, it's, in my view, as simple as that. What people don't know is she really was part of an international political movement around peace. I mean, for her, that was her primary issue. And so she and Jane Addams, after World War I, even went to Europe and convened women from Germany, etc., on an international peace conference and was accused in the New York Times of her and Adams of being traitors because they met with the enemy. But she was really convinced that one had to work, she was really part of Gandhi's movement and spent time in India, that we needed to work together with people that we most disagree with in order to achieve a world of peace. And for that I'm admiring of her. She paid a high price for it. She is one of 50 votes against World War I on her first day in Congress and on her first day uh, when she's elected for the second time before World War II, her first vote is the only vote against World War II. So she paid a uh, high price for that, and then she also led, as some of you know, uh, a strong movement against the, anti, uh, the Vietnam War as well at the end of her life. All right, well maybe leading into that is the second question from Tony. What do you know about Bell Weinstein's involvement in the suffrage movement? Oh, Bell and Frida. Thank you for asking about two of my most favorite dear, dear friends and women. I was lucky enough to be a young activist when these women were all still alive and active, and they were wonderfully supportive to all of us young activists who got to know them. Bell and Frida, uh, uh, Flegelman, come out of Helena's Jewish community, which was quite substantial. Uh, her father owned a very nice, the New Yorker clothing store, and so Bell and Frida both went to the University of Wisconsin, a very prestigious university, um, and in that movement they both became active as suffrage leaders on the campus, and then when they came back home, uh, got involved, and Bell became, uh, Jeanette Rankin hired her to work on her campaign, and then she was her chief of staff in Congress, and uh, so th that was uh, Bell, and then Frida, 
uh, was in Franz Boise's first doctoral class in anthropology in New York, and lived on the left bank, was a fabulous poet. Bell was also the first woman to serve in a jury in Montana back in the 1930s. Women were not allowed to serve because they would hear horrible things and could not control their emotions in making decisions. So Bell and Frida were both very much involved in suffrage and all the other political movements of the day, and very supportive in a mentoring way to those of us who were young activists who wanted to know the stories of what it was like back then. And I think, you know, certainly for me personally, uh, setting up some of the first women's history programs in the state of Montana back in the 70s is we want to know where we came from. Well, this is where I came from. I came from these movements with all of their shortcomings and all of their strengths. Is we look to the past for who we are and lessons of uh, how we got to where we're at now and what challenges were for them and what challenges remain for us. So for me, Bell and Frieda were both among those uh, as wonderful mentors and role models and uh, part of the diversity of Montana's history. Well, that's very inspiring story. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we have one last mail-in question. And uh, unless anyone has any other questions on the Facebook Live, send them in now as we're going to be wrapping this up shortly. So this question is uh, a little bit more broader. Internationally, the suffrage movement had many different eras. In England, it went back to the mid-1800s. French women didn't get the vote until 1944. Swiss until 1971. And Saudi Arabia until 2015. When did the suffrage movement start really taking hold in Montana? Well, again, I'll go back to saying, you know, we tend to think these movements are all isolated from each other. I think we don't have any comprehension of the degree to which many of these women were involved internationally back in that time. Those of you who've read uh, Frankenstein know that Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote that, a lot of that, a whole history, uh, she also wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Women, pulling that out of my ancient head, uh, back in that period. This discussion among the people who were involved in kind of the Enlightenment philosophers around human rights, uh, which really are the basis of the, Monta uh, the American Constitution. What did those involve? You know, when they wrote the Declaration, when they wrote the Constitution, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal. All are created equal. That's the discussion then, that's the discussion now. You know, are we moving toward that goal, and it's an international goal, or are we moving away from it? And it's uh, not an easy one to achieve. It's easy to stand up there and pledge allegiance to it. It's another thing to put it into place on a day-to-day -day basis. So these have been international movements. They wrote to each other. There were newspapers that went across the country. Montana, we view as isolated. Once the train came in in 1883 into Montana, these suffrage leaders were on the train traveling back and forth and coming into Montana and speaking. Um, so. It's not as though they're way out here in the wilderness alone trying to think this up and work on it. We are part of a national movement and an international movement for uh, the empowerment of women, which still goes on today, as you said. Uh, many countries, uh, not only those countries, don't fully grant rights to women or people on the basis of religion or sexual orientation or whatever. This country doesn't either, and we don't in this in this state either. So it is a uh, set of values that we hold in a, this democracy that's not yet fully realized. So we are still moving, hopefully, in that direction. So there's lots of work to be done. Come on board and do some of it. All right. Well, I just put out there to the Facebook world that we'll be wrapping it up after one last question, and we do have one last question. This one also, I would tune in again on September 29th for our uh, voting, Montana Votes 101, How To's Myth Busting and the History Of. So this one Can is... Can I chime in on uh, the end of that too? Now, the third one you're doing is on Native Americans. I think it's really important for people to tune into that one too. Because yes. the issue of sovereignty and citizenship is different in Indian country, and it's a history that... Uh, Montanans need to know it's part of our Constitution saying that every Montanan will come to understand something about Native culture and history, not just way past then, but now. That's the Indian Education for All Act. It's in our Constitution. So tuning in for that and trying to understand some of the more complicated issues that face our Native populations is really critical to this. You know, either we all get the vote and we all get to exercise it, or we 
or it's not equal for everyone. So stay tuned for part three as we well. We are very excited to part, about part three. We'll be working with Montana Native Vote, and we are still firming up the uh, when, but it will also be a live virtual series, and it will be in October, and we will get a date to you as soon as possible. And it looks like our last question here is from Lori Little Dog. What advice do you have for someone who is not 100% for a particular candidate? Should I just not vote, or should they just not vote? Thank you, Lori. <laughs> By the way, I'm wearing suffrage white. This is the color of the suffragists. Um, yeah, you know, okay, I'm going to fess up here. I was a 60s sort of radical. My first election that I voted in for president was 1968, and I didn't like any of the mainstream candidates, and I voted for Eldridge Cleaver of the Black Panther Party. So I, you know, it was a protest vote, and you have a right to a protest vote. But what I'm going to say is that, uh, I mean, that's something every citizen has to grapple with. God knows there's very few perfect candidates out there. I'm not one. I don't expect that the people who vote for me agree with me on everything or maybe even on the majority of things, but they think I'll represent them better than the other candidate or they believe I have integrity and honesty and will do the best I can to represent them. So if you want to be a political purist, you know, that's your right to do that or to not vote at all. But too much is really at stake. None of us get live in the perfect world here. You certainly can see from the history of this, none of it's been perfect. So if you're waiting for perfection, you're going to wait a long time here. And what that means is that you didn't have a say in how your government worked and who represented you. Uh, if you choose not to vote, you've chosen not to be represented in government. And I think that's something that's hard to live with. So, no, they're not perfect. Don't expect them to be. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Uh, try to move past that if you can. Hold them accountable. Raise the issues you want. We need to hear from you as elected officials. We go door to door. I did 19,000 doors before my last election to hear what you had to say, not to tell you so much who I was, but I wanted to know what you thought. That's our job is to represent you. So let us know what you think and find someone you're comfortable with voting for and vote for them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Diane. This has been an exceptional program. We love having you here. Your historical knowledge is fantastic. A lot of people have commented on our live stream about how much they appreciate just the history and the knowledge that you and the Historical Museum can bring to this topic. So again, thank you everyone who has tuned in. Check us out and follow us on uh, Historical Museum's Facebook page. September 29th is Montana Vote 101. And to be determined for a date in October, we will have Montana votes for Indigenous Peoples Right and the Montana Native vote. And this exhibit is online. This exhibit, yep, this exhibit is online. And if you really want to come and see it in person, please reach out to us. We are doing small uh, person tours, asking face masks and all of the safety measures we can. So reach out. Thank you again for...